We'll call this meeting of the Silver City Town Council to order. Please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If I could ask Councillor Bettison to read our mission statement, please. Thank you, Mayor. Silver City is the hub of an inclusive community settled within a small town that through guided growth honors and preserves its historical, cultural, and natural heritage while facilitating jobs, health, and educational resources such that the, vis the, res the residents and visitors may enjoy and protect the recreational opportunities of the area and high quality of life. Thank you. The first item with anything on the agenda is public input. We have quite a few this time. I remind everybody you have five minutes to speak. If you're looking at me, I will do my best to give you a one-minute warning. And the first person is David Thomas. Introduction of President WNM Communications. Come to the podium, please. Thank you. Just work or do I have to speak loud? Both okay. <laughs> I'll speak loud. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come to come before the council, and my primary reason is just to introduce myself and a little bit about the company that I represent. I moved to Silver City six months ago, taking the job of president and general manager of Western New Mexico Telephone, now known as Western New Mexico Communications. We're a company that has been headquartered in Silver City since 1973. And our primary core business is providing voice and data services to the rural communities that surround Silver City, such as Cliff, Lordsburg, Reserve, Magdalena, et cetera. Pro uh, approximately a year ago, we entered into the Silver City market to compete against CenturyLink, which is the old quest. So what we have chosen to do is bring competition to the Silver City market and thus provide better level of service to the residents, the government, and the business community and provide more advanced services. And as I said, we are a locally based company. Um, and I just wanted to take that opportunity to introduce myself to the council because being new to the city and being in the industry for over 30 years, I have always found it very important to get to meet and know the leaders of the community to see what we can do to support the community, to uh, help grow businesses in the community by bringing new technologies to the community, and then bringing those technologies with, as I said, a quality of service that we feel is better and a price that is anywhere from 30 to 40 percent less than what the incumbent carrier CenturyLink has today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Art Martinez, Reference Texas. Art Martinez. And good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, staff, friends, and vecinos, neighbors throughout the county and city. I uh, have come to say a few words with reference to taxes within the current economic conditions, some would perhaps say crisis, crises, throughout the nation, states, and locally even, obviously. And uh, I'm very concerned about this uh, for that primary reason is uh, we, the folks in the country and in Silver City or Grant County, have very little uh, extra cash uh, to outlay for the many services that we would like to have, but we just can't in the current conditions uh, be um, outlaying money for uh, some particular things because of the way things are. 
I saw a program highlighted on television the other day where it was pointed out that approximately one third of the U.S. states that the average sales tax at the state level was no current, uh, no higher, currently no higher than six percent, and in some cases less. And uh, now I uh, was impressed by that because we have. Uh, a higher tax in the state of New Mexico, and I think we'll need to do better. And one thing that takes place with reference to the state tax is that uh, the municipalities and the county pile on uh, taxes now and then, and uh, so that we uh, move from a, a situation where the average in the state of New Mexico that uh, many locals are paying is 7% and maybe a bit above that. And for us, uh, it happens to be at uh, 7.375. And that's higher than uh, many folks are paying in the state. And I know we can get uh, down to more specifics about that, but the point is that, uh, you know, we need to keep an eye on that and uh, begin to think in terms of limiting ourselves at county government and city government uh, so that uh, we can see if we can make our way through this very terrible uh, and stressful time for most of us. And so uh, I'm, I'm speaking of, uh, who knows, 80 to 99 percent uh, of folks. And so that's something that uh, has uh, begun to uh, be of much more concern to me. Uh, we do our very best, I know. And we're getting close here, so I'm just going to say that uh, I also saw a uh, forum of the candidates for city council over in Las Cruces, our neighbors over there, and they were being asked, uh, would they um, commit themselves to uh, not increasing taxes in their fair city before allowing the folks in the community by ballot referendum to determine whether they approve of that or disapprove of that. And that I would hope that you would respect us, your constituents, and uh, your friends and neighbors, and, and that's who we are. We just happen to have placed you in those seats so that you will do the best for us. Now, one thing I would say, and then I will uh, end this, if you don't mind. Oh, uh, okay. Get five minutes. All right. Thank you. I respect that. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Next on the list is Susan Allman with a list of probabil probably. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Councilors, staff, and Silver City people. The last speaker made a point that I would summarize as we're all spinning around on the planet together in the universe. We want to take care of it. We want our fair share. Uh, my name is Susan Allman. I think you said that already. Yes. You need to address us. I we're am, sir. Right. I'm hearing you. I'm addressing everybody. Is this better? That's much better. Got a whole minute like this. Um, my issues are one, food. The gospel mission is a vol totally volunteer um, service. They serve the poor, the hungry, 
to pass out commodities which we get from the government. But as far as our meals, they've expanded to morning coffee, Saturday pancakes. Um, they serve food six days a week, and it's all uh, donations. They need more food. And I told Randy that I'd bring it up. Number two. Hmm, I forget number two right now. What was it? Say it. Just say it. You said chickens. Yeah, chickens. If we have chickens, then we don't need to go to safe, not Safeway, the store and buy eggs. We can share eggs with each other. We can even give them to the gospel mission. Everything is tied in. And now number three is near and dear to my heart, and it's water. I think everybody knows my philosophy, Awa es Vida. Water is life. For those who don't speak Spanish, I think we, well, most of us do. I'm going to have petitions. I don't have them tonight, but I'll be outside afterwards to hand out cards for the people that give cert uh, sell certificates for support and service animals. A lot of us are interested. Also a new gallery opening. It's going to be at midnight. Midnight Madness. It's on Broadway. I'll hand out cards. It's going to be champagne for those who like champagne. Good beers. It's a young guy. It's a lively and new energetic. We have Thanksgiving, and then the next day is Shopping Madness. And then Balich is opening the Top Hat Gallery on Broadway in Baird at midnight of that night the next morning and then Saturdays the lighted Christmas parade and then I got to go back somewhere for a warrant and I got to go to court in Tucson. Uh, my petitions will be around later. I have to first go to Palomas and give them food and clothing. Those are my issues. Thank you. I've lost my place, my sense of direction. <clears throat> Next is Kate Dunnigan, reference to small business license. Hello. I wasn't expecting to be able to have the opportunity to speak at this meeting, so I'm a bit unprepared. But I'm speaking on behalf of um, giving a small business license in town. I own a small business in Arenas Valley. It's Best Pond. That was owned by my father, Daniel Dunnigan. And I thought I had followed all of the procedures in order to get this small license, uh, business license because I um, have the building. I've built the gun safe. I've um, met with all my customers prior to making this move since my father's death, and about 85% of them are in favor of me moving there. When I first came here, I'm from Albuquerque. Um, I'm a psychologist. My partner, business partner, is Robert Barraza, and he's a, a social worker. Um, I thought, I'm just going to close it down. And the more I got to talk to the people, our customers, and the community, I realized that we really are an asset to this community. And I would um, talk more about it, but I ran into some glitches in the system because I was misinformed, which can happen or maybe I misunderstood. But I was misinformed about what I needed to do to follow all these steps. And I was told that just to get my license from the county, I had to transfer it to the city. So I did all of those things. And at the last minute, I was informed that I needed to come to the city council and get your people's approval. And so I don't know what to do except introduce myself 
see if this is something I've never spoken in front of a council. I'm not like my father. Um, and so I don't know if this is the next step or if I can be approved because I was told by different council people who I have stopped to on email and telephone calls. I apologize. Um, if I could have an expedited um, meeting prior to November 22nd because I planned a grand opening and um, my customers are expecting it. I'm paying a lot of money, to be frank with you, to operate two um, businesses, and I'm not sure of the process that I need to go through. I was informed by a um, member of the council that there was an opportunity that on the 22nd, because it's Thanksgiving, the meeting might be canceled. And so, um, okay, you said no. Okay, <laughs> good. So I was worried about that. So I wanted to, I just need your information of what I should be prepared for in order that I might be able to get my small business license and open on the day after Thanksgiving because that's what I'm looking to do. If that's it, after, under reports, I'm going to ask the county or the town manager. So you'll you'll answer my. We will answer them here. Thank in, you, sir. In a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks. So just go. <laughs> but don't but don't leave because you're going to get okay, some information here in a minute. And Maria. My name is Maria Izquierdo. I'm the family coordinator for the system of care. And I would like to take the time to invite all our audience to our next meeting. It's going to be this Thursday, November 10, at the Wellness Coalition from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And uh, the agency that is coming to present is LifeQuest Early Childhood. Anybody can come in and uh, bring their questions and suggestions to them so that way they could work better together with the families and we provide child care we offer a $15 gift card from Walmart and we provide a meal and this is also free so I'm hoping everybody to um, know about it that we're meeting actually twice a month so I'm going to keep coming for the next because each meeting is different we have different subjects that we do so that's why I want to come in and let you guys know about it Y ahora pues quisiera decir en español ¿verdad? para toda la audiencia, quisiera invitarlos a que vinieran a compartir con nosotros este, nuestra próxima reunión de apoyo a la familia sería este próximo jueves, noviembre 10, de 6 y media a 8 de la noche en el Wellness Coalition y eso es en la calle uh, Buller, en el 409, en el norte de, de la calle Buller. So, quisiera que todos pudieran este, compartir con nosotros, como dije, todo esto es gratis, probemos comida, cuida de niño y rifamos una tarjeta de 15 dólares. Do you have any questions? Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is council comments. Councilor Moranis, would you like to start? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Well, it looks like there's going to be a lot of things to be talking about during the, uh, the body of this meeting, so I'm going to keep these short. Uh, I'd like to first off uh, talk a little bit about taxes uh, with my experiences uh, with uh, taxes from my profession. New Mexico is probably going to be one of those third of the states reporting less than 6% um, sales tax because the state piece is only 5%. Everything else is just what's been tacked on by counties and, and cities. Uh, so New Mexico is one of the lower sales tax states. What's also interesting is um, because of not taxing food and not taxing medical and, and not taxing those who are, have subsidized food, uh, such as food stamps, really the, uh, the, the less, uh, the, those individuals with the less wherewithal to, to pay sales tax are not paying those. So, so we have a pretty decent system in that, in that regard. 
what's also nice is that we have probably one of the larger income taxes in the in the uh, nation. But interestingly enough, it's a progressive tax that really gets hit with the higher earners, those with the wherewithal to pay. So again, favoring a lot of the the body of our of our citizens, especially in this town. And then uh, one of the final taxes that you find in in states is property taxes. And interestingly enough, we have one of the lowest property taxes in the nation, which leads to much lower rents for those who are renters, and then also much more uh, uh, e easily paid housing cost, which has really helped us out in our state. So, so we've done pretty well. And I think in this town, um, and Alex could could uh, maybe uh, give some clarification as this, we haven't raised our sales tax piece in a long time, if that's correct, right? That's correct. In fact, uh, municipalities have the ability to impose up to 7.65 uh, mills uh, on property tax. The town uh, currently has imposed 1.5, and that hasn't been raised since, I believe, a long time. <laughs> so, so we've got probably, as far as the, the municipal portion of property tax, we've got we, we probably have, have the lowest property tax anywhere. And we haven't, got, we haven't changed our sales we, tax in, in a while either. And the sales tax hasn't been changed since, well, it's been 10 years. 10 years. And, and you know, I, so I just want to point that out to, to those listening. Uh, I, I, I think it's a very important point because taxes do change uh, a lot of our disposable income and how that's utilized, whether it's we're, we're using our income for our own purposes or if we're just giving it to uh, higher powers to try to determine what's best. And, and it is a good question, and I'm glad that it's been brought up, and, and I could hopefully clarify a couple things in the state and in, in our town. Um, on a final comment, um, I, I, I'm announcing that I will be rerunning for District 4 uh, City Council. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Rick. Yes, sir. I have a few comments. Can you hear me? Can you hear me better? Sure. Okay. Anyway, I am going to announce also that I'm going to be running for District 3 also in, uh, in March as my term is almost up in March, April. So I do plan to run again. Oh, I plan to run. And... Um, Getting back to what Mr. Morgan said about about the taxes, I don't know if you were implying, Mr. Martinez, about taxes on property taxes also. I don't know, but if I may be so bold as to say that your property taxes will go up. And and last week I came to pay my taxes, and there was an individual there, and he asked the clerk here why the taxes were so high on his property and his answer was that they passed some bond issues school bond issues and the thing is that the school bond issues when they pass it's only the property owners that get the foot of the tax am I correct? so I want to clarify that also with you no 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 this is not a question okay, 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 okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. It's okay. Also, I, uh, we are going to have a lot of flack, I guess, on the, on the chicken issue. So let's be fair about it, about the chickens. And let's see how it comes up about on tonight's meeting. Bear with us because not everything that we do and say is going to be helpful to everybody. Some people will like it, some people won't like it. Maybe one thing we should do is maybe we should put out to vote for the people to see if they want to have it. That's just a thought. Um, thank you. Thank you. Black is only one letter away from the clock. Councillor <laughs> 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 Johnson. Uh, no comments. Thank you. Councillor Bettison. No comments. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Dr. Martinez, you, you brought up some some very good concerns. 
and just this week the governor had announced that there was she was wanting to make some changes in the tax code that affect gross receipts and decreasing gross receipts for giving the smaller businesses from paying the gross receipts if they have a they don't meet a certain threshold to send a check to the state every month the the interesting thing with that they can change in Santa Fe and decrease the tax burden that the, the business pays but it doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to pay it at the register because it's gross receipts and it will have a negative impact potentially on municipalities and we have absolutely no control it depends on what portion of the gross receipts she decides to forgive and I really really hope that that the legislature pays attention to this and and doesn't just go in there blindly saying you know times are tough we've got to start um, giving money back when one is it's still going to be collected at the register it's a pass-through from the customer so it would actually be in, an incentive to the business not necessarily a tax forgiveness as well as the impact on municipalities Silver City is doing very well there's many many communities in this state that are not and that are struggling to make payroll every month so I really hope that, that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater on this topic that we've we've got to develop strong tax policy the other issue with tax that has always been a concern we live and die as, as municipalities on gross receipts tax the counties are supported mostly off of property tax well property tax is somewhat more stable than gross receipts and is much more stable than many categories of gross receipts tax so if they're going to start messing with the gross receipts tax and how that is structured and divvied up between the, the recipients of it, the local communities, the municipalities, counties, and the state share, they, re they really have to pay attention and make sure that they're not just taking away all the money out of the municipalities while the county's funds are, are continuing to build as valuations change. Um, so it's it's really a complicated issue that I, I I'm sure that the the news reporters aren't getting into the the depth that is being considered but it's really important um, as far as the the business license issue in the code it's it states that she needs to get a, a bond approved by the the town council does she can she just do that through the clerk's office to get on the agenda or does that need to go through community development well, I was going to suggest that uh, the one thing that she that she can do the one thing that she can do to expedite the process is to go get the bond right now as soon as she can and submit it to the clerk it doesn't require a hearing so if you delegate to the clerk the authority to uh, admit the bond and uh, and I'll look at it then I think that would be a fast way uh, she doesn't have to come before the council she just needs to submit it uh, through the clerk the clerk can then at the next meeting submit it to the council for approval after we review it I don't think that she actually needs to be here the, the bond does need to make an appearance at a council meeting but the bondholder does not correct unless we find if we find a problem with it we'll work it out with her beforehand okay and if there is a problem and we, we don't work it out beforehand then I would advise her to show up here and work it out with you okay so the, the direction right now is she needs to get the bond and take it to our town clerk and and we will you will evaluate it and if there's any issues then you'll discuss it with the bondholder correct and if not it'll come it'll be on the next council meeting Councilor. one question because when i read that because i talked with um it's done again uh the uh the concern that i would have is it does say in there that the town council has to approve it before she can get her business license so by 
she wouldn't be able to get her business license until the 22nd anyway. Correct? She'll get her business license once the bond is accepted. Once you as a body accept the bond, and that will be upon our recommendation. So, yes, the 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 action will be on the 22nd. If that's it, is that the next meeting? The yeah. 22nd. Uh, so it will be on the agenda. And she wants a business license. When's your grand opening? The day after Thanksgiving. Yeah, we should. That, that'll work out. On the 23rd, you'll get your red business license. If, if the bond is fine, the very next day we can issue the business license. You bring the bond to this lady up at town hall. Okay. Your name? Ann Mackey. I know. If there's if there's any discussions that develop as you deal with this that lead you to believe we need to have a special meeting, let's let's address that. And I mean, if if we need to do it a, a day or two ahead to ensure that. I, I think there's some other issues involving the FFL and that she needs to, to get addressed tonight. So let's let's make sure that if we if we're com confident that we can get it resolved on the 22nd and get her her necessary paperwork to have her opening on the 25th, then that's fine. If not, let's step it up. The the things that are in our control are the bond and the business registration license. FFL is federal. If there's any federal or state requirements, she needs to find another source to learn what to do because I can't advise her. No, I, I understand that, but it. We're. I think we're okay. <laughs> Thank you. And last but not least, apparently it's announcement night. And Every year, this this gets more and more difficult for me. But some of the things that I have to evaluate, one is I speak with my family and make sure that I have my family support. I have to do a lot of self-reflection, make sure that that I still have the energy and the drive to to do the the job that that you've asked me to do. And. I also talked to many advisors and try to gather as much information as I possibly can when I make my decision whether whether I want to continue running for office or not. I also look back over the last almost six years that I've been mayor and look at the work that we've done. And I think we've done some amazing work. We've improved the the level of customer service within the town. We've improved the level of transparency within the town. We've done some great projects. We've accomplished a lot of stuff. And we have not raised taxes. But we have we are one of the towns that are sitting very financially stable. We just got a standard and poor A-plus rating to demonstrate that. This council, and I've, I've had many up here with me in the last six years, this council, is, as we said today, is, is very strong. And I think that's as well demonstrated by the A-plus rating as that is a part of their evaluation. Another aspect that I truly do consider is the staff that we work with. And many of you are here tonight. Alex, Robert, um, the Chief, Sherwood, Jim, it, it's truly an honor to work with you guys and to work with a, with a group of professionals like this. And it definitely makes my job a lot easier. So I am willing to run again if you so choose to have me. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So that's that's my decision for the night that I will run again for mayor beyond the ballot in March. 
and I, do, I will encourage you to please, please get out and vote. There's because we had a resignation on the last election. Councillor Ray is is running in an off year, which means there's four out of five of us that sit up here that are going to be our positions will be on the ballot. So it's really important that you get out and you be heard and show up to vote. We've had some horrendously low turnouts and some of it we could accept as a vote of confidence. Some of it I'm just not satisfied with. And I don't think there's a single person that's sitting up here right now that takes a single vote for granted. We want to work very hard for every vote that we get and we do that over the terms that we currently sit on and that we're serving. So please get out, vote, support your town, support yourselves, and we will have an election in March. Anybody need round two? Yes, I do. Councilor. Mr. Mayor, round two. <laughs> I am very happy to be on the council. And I agree with the mayor here that we do have a very strong group of people. The, um, Robert, the chief, Mr. Brown, all of us. One of my plans when I first came on, I told Mr. Brown, I told the mayor that I would like to see economic development. And I would like to see it downtown. And I've talked to, to a lawyer here, to, 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 to Mr. Robert Scavern, Hoven, and... Uh, he has given me some ideas, and I have talked to him about some ideas. And that's one of the goals that I would like to see is downtown. Also, with, Ms. with the mayor here, maybe the city can do something for the veterans also, and maybe with the hospital also. So those are, those are a few things that I would like to see done as being a counselor and working with these people here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just just so you know, as you, we speak about economic development, economic development and, and the way that that system works in the communities is, is very, very confidential up until a point that the company is ready to make a decision and announce. I mean, they go as far as using code names, so we can't go do Internet searches and find out who, who we're dealing with. We get criteria that they're searching, and it's very they protect their proprietary information. I can, you can rest assured that there is a lot of discussion going on with potential recruitment opportunities and some meetings are going on that we just can't discuss publicly without risking totally losing that opportunity. But hopefully we'll be successful and we'll recruit some of them that are here talking to us and it'll, it'll be a, a productive at the end of the day, but we're bound by some confidentiality rules. So, anybody else? We will move on. Are there any changes to the agenda? No. Seeing none, we'll move on to approval of minutes of the special meeting October 18th, 2011. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the minutes of the special meeting of October 18th, 2011. Mr. Mayor, I second that motion. There's a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the special meeting October 18th, 2011. Is there any discussion? There's a motion and a second, no discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is approval of minutes of the regular meeting October 25th, 2011. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the minutes of the regular meeting of October 25th, 2011. Second. There's a motion and a second to approve. Is there any discussion? There's a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of the Town Council October 25th, 2011. No further discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. That was one. Um, next item on the agenda is reports, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mayor and Council, I just wanted to report that today uh, we closed on the uh, $6.3 million worth of bonds that we just issued. The money's in the bank. 
taxes? Did it raise taxes to get the... Uh, so uh, that money's all... Uh, we refinanced some of those loans to free up, free up cash that we uh, are currently using for debt service. And then we've got the $5 million. It's a little bit more than $5 million, actually, uh, for the projects. Um, some status on some of the projects is the uh, the, the roof at the parks uh, maintenance shop will be on the first meeting in December for award of the bid. We're currently in discussions with um, the school, and that project will get uh, the tennis courts will get underwear underway very quickly, and, and the baseball fields uh, is well underway. Yes, we're laughing at you. Very <laughs> <laughs> nice. <thing. laughs> um, can you give us an update on Penny Park? Yeah. Yes, the uh, demolition will be um, done on uh, awarded because we went out for quotes to get the demolition done. Uh, one one quote was a uh, almost gave me a heart attack, but it was ninety eight thousand uh, dollars. The second quote was thirty thousand dollars, so they were both above, uh, well above the threshold where we had to go out to to bid to get the job done. So it's out to bid right now. It will be coming to the twenty second council meeting. And once that uh, demolition is done, then we can actually start the uh, the construction. I mean, do the award since it's on a state contract of uh, one of the the um, the, the options that we proposed. Uh, we've got the results of of the public input. Uh, it seems that. Uh, option one and four are the top two uh, options that were, were chosen, so um, I'll get that information to all of you. So hopefully the day that we uh, award the demolition, I would hopefully get some guidance from the council as to which one we can move forward on, because we can uh, go ahead and um, award that contract to the state contractor so they can start ordering all the equipment and get it in as soon as possible. Additionally, can can we get the conceptual drawings that we have now and fill in the blanks? That's already that's already underway. Underway. What what happened was um, a lot of the input that that we got from the well, the public input was uh, more shade, trees, water, um, those types of things. Uh, so we had the contractor. They're actually filling in some of those blanks of where we could put some shade and trees and those types of things. That way we can, uh, when we come that day, and show you both options, or all four options if you choose, so that we bring all four. Um, they would be filled with uh, different options of where we would be putting those types of things in. You know, I, you know, uh, Alex, I would really prefer to see the, the two top ones that, you know, we've heard from the community, from public input that they want to see. Those, to me, are the most important to have filled in and completed. Um, I, I would want to select from those two rather than from all of them, to be honest with you, but that's that's me. I, I agree. Okay. But there, was a, there was a fairly large spread on the... On the numbers. The other thing is, let's make sure that we look at at the things that they wanted moved. If we can fit the spider that's in four spider web over to one, if that's where we go. Let's, yeah, let's try I, I've got that information, and I'll I'll get it to you within the next week, so that way you guys can see the information that we received. And we have to make sure that the train is there because that was very popular. That's and the only one that only thing that only one person wanted. Just make sure that Mr. Skybron will fit in it. <laughs> <laughs> People like trains. They, they actually do like trains, and and there was more than one <laughs> that chose train. So, thank you. Any other report? No, sir. Questions for Mr. Brown? 
Um, Chief? Thank you. Sure would. <laughs> <laughs> Anything from community development, Jim? I think that's all we got here. <laughs> We will move on to unfinished business. Approval, disapproval of ordinance number 1186, an ordinance amending municipal code chapter 2, article 2, election section 2-50, B1 through 4, reorganizing existing town council districts of the town of Silver City, commonly known as Plan A1. And we have the presentation available, but I think we've all seen it multiple times. We've had the numbers in front of us for several weeks now. Um, does anybody feel that they need to see the presentation again? Thanks. Anybody want to talk about this ordinance? Um, I, I would. You have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have mentioned before in several meetings that I prefer, I prefer this uh, Plan A-1, this ordinance, over Plan B, um, simply because of some of the um, items that have been mentioned by um, Dr. Martinez and uh, Dr. Manzanares uh, in previous council meetings, that on the face of it, both of the both of the plans are within the guidelines that the government um, lists. But um, I feel that Plan A one ensures that. Um, both in District 2 and in District 4 that people can um, elect from their communities of interest. And it still gives a slight majority of um, Hispanic in the voting ages in uh, count, um, Districts 1 and 3. Um, I, I'm concerned about Plan B, and I, I want to discuss that now simply because uh, I think that by um, changing the districts as uh, proposed, um, it will dilute the Hispanic vote, and there cannot be um, a surety that one of those districts will be able to elect from their community of interest the same way District 2 will be able to elect from their community of interest, which is white and Hispanic. So um, with that, I move to approve. Do you want to? Let, let's go through comment. And I haven't okay. even gotten to the audience. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, I think I'm not kind of really bothered between either one of them. Um, I think they're both improvements, of course, and but um, and and uh, our concerns are universal. It appears, uh, Dr. Montanaris and Dr. Martinez. We're uh, interested in communities and interest of, of interest or vulnerable communities, and um, that's I think everyone's concern. So uh, the differences are merely in um, how we feel each one would uh, protect those communities of interest. Um, when when I look at uh, I think. What I'm concerned, I talked about this last time, is the amount of interior edge because interior edge on any of these districts is going to uh, show how much you uh, break up neighborhoods. Um, and you can see this numerically that uh, the A1 has uh, 21 precincts versus uh, the B is like 17 precincts. Um, the average number of uh, precincts per district is is much less in B and so generally I mean this is you know, the biologist and he comes out um, edge is really dangerous for uh, vulnerable species and it doesn't matter if it's if we're talking about communities of interest or we're talking about endangered species they're uh, hard on them and so if we look at uh, if we if we look at the maps Look at um, A1. Um, well, if, if we compare the two, uh, my district, District 2, the amount of edge doesn't really change that much. Uh, there's a significant difference in um, uh, 1, 3, and 4. And it's only, all you're looking at is the interior 
edge. So what that is is the lines differentiating the different districts. The outside lines don't matter. So that's my only concern. And like I said, I don't really – I'd go with either one. I think they're both great. I think what happens, too, is we're getting really close, like the mayor said. We're getting really close to that magic number where we go to at large. And the reason for that, I imagine, is because as communities expand in numbers, in order to reach representative numbers, you're going to get elongation. And I imagine that's why the last districts were so – they appeared so gerrymandered. I mean, you see District 3 is – looks like an hourglass, kind of crazy. And what happens at some point from that – those elongations is after a while it becomes untenable, and so then they go to at large. So that was my concern. With all due respect to Kelso Thompson's interior edge, while we are mammals and we're species, we're people, and we can't necessarily take something that's a biological construct that's been done for, let's say, blackbirds or something else like that and apply it to people. That's the anthropologist in me. So we have these opposing concerns here. I think that my understanding in the original design of this, I'm not even sure that it happened at 10,000 where they went to four districts. I think it was a request by, in particular, the people of District 4, the way it currently sits, and it's closely approximated in the Plan A-1, that they're the ones that wanted to make sure that they were represented adequately on the council. At least that's my understanding from talking to former mayor. So I think that what's most important and what the law dictates is that we don't dilute the minority vote. That's one of the primary things. Compactness is one, but you can't dilute the minority vote over that. So that's still the reason for strongly, my strong support of A-1. Councilor Morris. Thank you, Mayor. You know, the idea of not diluting the minority, the Hispanic vote is very important. And though I innately was drawn towards B, and I'm still very drawn towards B, it's a much better looking plan. It seems equitable, and it does give simple majorities in three districts to the Hispanic voters. But I do believe that, as I talked about at the last meeting, there is a variable that's not talked about here, and that is that there is low turnouts among Hispanic voters, and that's where we get this dilution. Even with a simple majority, they're still not feeling represented. And that's very important, and we do need to make sure that they do feel that they do feel like they're being represented by the people of their choice. But on a and for that reason, I am in strong support of A-1, and that's of these two proposals. That's the A-1 is what I'm going to be supporting with a small criticism, and that is it's unfortunate that I believe this to be true, that in spite of this being a self-perpetuating problem, we need to participate. We need to vote. There may be a time where that argument is not going to be holding up anymore, and with our simple majorities, we're going to need to make sure that we do feel represented, and that's going to be through participation. But at this point in time, I'm supporting A-1. Any other discussion? I'm supporting A-1. I support A-1. I just make a comment. With all due respect to Counselor Thompson, I really don't buy the division. For one, we're a small enough town, and it really, really irritates me 
if a counselor gets a call and it turns out to not be in their district and they say, well, call your call your counselor. You know, we're, we may be elected by district, but it's small enough town. We can deal with each other, and we shouldn't necessarily have to worry about the district lines other than when we're campaigning <laughs> so we don't walk on the wrong street and then confuse everybody that they're the candidate that was at their house isn't on the ballot. So there's also many, many other divisions within the town. And if you look at the neighborhoods as they've been developing little neighborhood associations quite rapidly in the last year, our neighborhood had some concerns because the subdivision that I live in is bordering some some other older subdivisions and some of the effects on that subdivision have effects on our subdivision and you know if we truly go back to looking at all the interior borders from the subdivisions and the, the problems that each one has or causes on a neighbor the the interior lines go crazy all over this town and so I really think we we may get elected by district, but we be, we really need to be thinking at large. And when we do our priority list, whether it's infrastructure or any other project that we take on, we need to be considering the entire town at large. And obviously, if if we get straight away, we do have you do have district representation that can can bring us back in the line, but. I, I don't have an issue with either one of these plans. I, I would like to think, Denise, and you've made several trips down here, and I think your your company has, has done the town a very good service, and it is appreciated. So anybody in the audience would like to speak? Dr. Martinez, to you have the floor. Thank you very much. Councilor Morona, I appreciate uh, everyone's comments and yours being specific to something that I have here. Uh, you had mentioned, and it was reported in the press, the media in general, uh, this matter having to do with why we need to have, at this time in the history of Silver City in the country, Super majorities is uh, sometimes debatable, and and uh, some have questioned that, but it is critical still. And I want to, to be on the record for the future of the whole town and uh, anyone else that there are darn good reasons why we must continue, not the least of which is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And uh, it's been necessary in some places in the United States and in localities to call in attorneys. We've done it here in Silver City before. I've been a part of that. And held press conferences and everything else to be sure that everything goes in accordance with the law and uh, the morality of fairness and all these sorts of things which we support, I'm sure, uh, very much. And we must continue to do so. And having read a couple of times what uh, you said, uh, I have been on record uh, with articles back east uh, published, and, and uh, I just want to uh, say to those who might still have some qualms or differences with uh, regard to supermajorities and so forth, and why are we? Why do we need to do this? Why do we need to show some sort of preference like this? Uh, can't we just all get on, along so well that we can be at large and uh, that we can be uh, uh, where we want to be in this city and in the country? And so I'll just say, and I'm going to avoid uh, quite a bit here, but I'm just going to get right to it, and that is to say that uh, there are many studies, and some of them are mine, that show uh, that political participation and electoral 
participation uh, have pointed out electoral reforms, I have meant to say, have concluded that minority persons do have this considerably lower turnout historically. And several factors are so that we can better understand and embrace this for now, hoping that we come to the day, yes, but we come to the day, that uh, we will be more unified and fair with one another. And um, I think it's coming. With reference to some of the minorities in the United States, their average age is lower than the national average. Their average age is lower than the city uh, age. And that is because of the larger families where this group has one, maybe two. These families over here have five, maybe six. And most of them are younger, of course, uh, than the age that needed to be voting. And so then you get that population that's larger, but most of them in there, you see, a third of them uh, are not uh, of uh, a mature age for voting. Another matter is having to do with uh, the depressed poverty status of minority members in the United States. And we're beginning to see that uh, we're uh, having many, many folks who are joining uh, the others in this situation. But uh, when you have a depressed poverty status, then that uh, is a negative to many people who might otherwise be voting. There is a lower registration level of voters in minority communities. Too bad, but it's true. So then we're going to have to uh, get working uh, to see that uh, everyone is registered who can be and should be and that uh, they, in fact, participate. There's the lower socioeconomic levels. There are the lower educational levels that continue to plague the folks who live in the barrios and live in the ghettos and poor people in general. Appalachia, you, you name it. White folks in America are also poor. And they also suffer. And so that we need to be working all over the country for all the different uh, people. And, uh, heck, we just saw last week that the statistics now out of uh, Washington, D.C. and other places uh, that uh, those people living right below the poverty levels have sunk down to 50 percent of poverty. So it's getting worse. I believe it is important, too. And some would say, oh, you should have skipped this one. There are differences over it. It just brings it up in front of everyone again. Important, too, is the number of potential voters. Potential voters. They're out there. A lot of them. Still working toward their citizenship. I used to do voter registration and get out the votes in East L.A. And every fourth home uh, were persons working toward their citizenship ineligible to vote. And so then we have to bring them into the system so that we can improve the system in this country, in America. And so uh, maybe we can do volunteer work in this area. Some of us do more of it. And then uh, I, I'll just give another one and we'll get off of it because of time factors. But another one certainly is a consequence of the political inefficacy of feeling, the feeling, which means the feeling of powerlessness, which many of the poor and the ethnic and racial minorities in the country, whoever they are, believe 
uh, they, they have this sense of powerless to, uh, powerlessness and futility. And, and they've gone out there and, and uh, they've tried their best and many times they do not get the results. And they get uh, disillusioned and drop out. Let's bring them back in. And let's improve all these things we've been talking about and act to get it done. Thank you. Susan? My neighbor's always so articulate, he's a hard act to follow, but I think I will take it from the bottom up. Um, I think it's a great idea to have um, voting at large. Um, then everybody can be happy and satisfied. I think it's important also that we don't feel that we're satisfied, but that we are satisfied. And if we can vote for whomever we want, we should be satisfied. Hopelessness keeps people from the polls. They say, what's the difference? They're not representing me. I'm still poor. Um, Susan, we're, we're the ones that are going to vote on this. So 30 years it. ago, it was the hanging chads, or I don't know the dates. It was stopping them by roadblocks. It was making them pay. Um, the Constitution says everybody who's here is entitled to the same rights, right to vote, even if they don't have their papers yet. Somebody drew a line and called it the border and decided north of the border, the Norteños, us, are going to be rich, and south of the border, the Sureños, will be poor. They're our playground. I don't know what to say. It's so ridiculous. And that's my position. Well said, sir. You are a hard act to follow. So I had to don't turn, it, it. turn it upside it. down. I mean, even who some people would call the crackers. I wouldn't call them the crackers. The Ku Klux Klan, the ones, Susan. the racists. Susan. The racist. Let's, um, let's get on the topic. We're exactly. you got to listen. No, I don't. The race We're discussing the districting. Can you yes, discuss that? That's why I am saying we are all um, victims of the current system, economic, political, um, color lines, the good old boys so, oh, uh, and girls. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Thompson. Um, Dr. Martinez brought up the factors of uh, the turnout in general, and I think, I, I hope I can communicate that that's my concerns as well. Um, the question is really... Um, how uh, those factors of low turnout would be affected by uh, these two distributions. Um, my guess would be that if the, what the interior edge represents is uh, people that live across the street who um, have different districts. So if your uh, the voting years come up at different times, then that's a confusion. That's something that. Uh, uh, makes the voting process more difficult. So my guess would be, I mean, it really it's a, it's a toss-up, right? The supermajority is great. I think that's great. The trade-off is, is it greater than the loss in complexity that, uh, that you, well, what you lose in, in uh, A1 in complexity and, and edge? That's my, that's my only point. Um, I personally think that given the local situation, that uh, being across the street is going to be more critical than uh, an increment difference of the supermajority. Um, 
But like I said, I don't really care. One way or the other. <laughs> They're fine, both of them. Thank you. Councilor Bettison. Mr. Mayor. I move that we approve ordinance number 1186, an ordinance amending municipal code chapter 2, article 2, elections, section 2, dash 50, B, 1 through 4, reorganizing existing town council districts of the town of Silver City, also known as Plan A1. Is there a second? Mr. Mayor, I second that motion. There's a motion and a second to approve ordinance 1186 as presented. Is there any discussion by the council? There's a motion, a second, and no discussion regarding ordinance number 1186, an ordinance amending municipal code, chapter 2, article 2, election, section 2-50, two two B-124, reorganize existing town council districts of the town of Silver City. Roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Mr. Mayor. Oh, Look, ordinance number 1187, an ordinance amending municipal code chapter 2, article 2, election section 2 50, B 1 through 4, reorganizing existing town council districts for the town of Silver City, commonly known as Plan B. This should be a moot point, but is there a motion? Seeing no motion, ordinance number 1187 is dead. Councilor Bettison. Mr. Mayor, I move for a short break. Is there a second? Mr. Mayor, I think. There's a motion and a second for a short break. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries for in recess. Let's call this meeting back to order. The next item on the agenda is approval, disapproval of ordinance number 1188, an ordinance amending chapter 6, section 6 1, definition, section 6 4, keeping of dogs and cats, section 6 6, keeping of cattle, horse, fowl, or livestock restricted, section 6 55, citations, contents, section 6 56, failure to pay penalty assessment or correct violation, section 6 78, annual license permit of the town of Silver City Municipal Code. Councilor Moronis, would you like to start your introduction? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Bettison and, and and I started working on this um, actually did probably close to this summer and this was this was partly due to some some issues that that arose uh, in town with some of our citizens who had chickens and and that was one of the the major thrusts for for this ordinance. A couple of issues uh, arose that that uh, we felt were were potential problems. One, one of the items was. Uh, that I took uh, exception to is, is I, I wanted to see that there was definitely a, a corrective action plan put into these so, so that uh, individuals could be uh, notified that they, that they are in violation to one of our ordinances and that they have a reasonable time to uh, make good, uh, to, to come back into compliance with, with our ordinances. And this is better than, than just being issued citations and having to go through the court proceedings and everything. This is a, this is a method uh, on, on two levels. One, it's so our staff is not going to court on, on simple violations. And also, as an information, uh, to be informative to our citizens and, and allow them to fix problems that they may not have known uh, existed. And this, this addresses one of those issues. Um, outside of that, its main thrust is is on the allowing of chickens in in, in our town, and um, what what we need to to do to do so, and, and what what's fair for both those who want the want chickens, and what's fair for those who are neighboring those who want chickens, and. Uh, Councilor Bettison and I, we researched a, a number of communities, and we came up with a couple communities that, that, that we really liked the language in, in their ordinances, and that uh, helped motivate us in, in many of the um, parts to, to this. It's fairly balanced. It has uh, subjective and objective standards. Um, you know, in many cases, Without objective standards, you're, you're, you're strictly relying on a nuisance-based uh, ordinance. 
And when we look at that, we, we have, you know, we, we've talked uh, among staff and everything and, and talked, well, how, how often does, does uh, nuisance-based complaints come before our town? And, and they, don't come, they don't come by very often, mainly because people are afraid. They don't want to complain about their neighbors. They may have some strong issues, and they just will not, they just refuse to complain. They refuse to show up in court. So we, we need to set some standards, uh, um, some minimal standards to help set what nuisances are so that we can actually um, inf get something that is, that is truly enforceable. So we, we've, we've tried to balance this, uh, this amendment for that. Uh, on another comment, we, I know we've had many comments about, uh, from individuals that, that think that uh, what we've set for, for chickens is not on par with, with, with dogs. And had we done so, there, there was two alternatives. We could bring the dogs up to par, in which case we will not have success with this ordinance. We could not do it as fast. We wouldn't be here today. We, we, we wouldn't have finished drafting it. And we'd have, uh, a, we would have a much more difficult time with su successfully getting this passed. The other alternative is actually having no, uh, very little standards for the chickens as, like, as we do with the dogs. And that would have also been very difficult to get past. So, so we've actually drafted this, hopefully, for success, and, and, that's, and that's what um, I believe we, we've done. Thank you, sir. I just want to say that um, I agree with everything that Councillor Moronis has uh, stated. And I would just like to emphasize, um, because of the number of um, emails that and phone calls that I've received during this waiting period, that I want everybody to really, really understand that we did so much research. We worked closely with um, the town attorney. We have tried to incorporate uh, concerns from all of our citizens so that what we feel, at least what I feel that we've done, is we've developed an ordinance that does strike a balance between those individuals desiring chickens, those that do not, and uh, those that really are in between, and it, it's not really too much of a, um, a problem. But that it's an ordinance, or at least amendments, that um, actually meet the needs of our citizens in our town. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, uh, suggestions about uh, we, other towns in the state of New Mexico, and um, at, the, at that point we, we really felt that those, those ordinances wouldn't meet the needs of our citizens and the comments that we'd received. I would like to say that um, after hearing a lot of public input, from a wide variety of people that um, I would hope that we could amend the um, ordinance uh, to strike Chapter 6, Section 6-4A, um, which is the, oops, I forgot to write it down, the keeping of dogs and cats, to completely strike that section um, 6-4A, and what that would do is it reverses to the current uh, town ordinance, which would limit the number of dogs and cats um, to any combination of two. We're going to get this. Mr. Mayor, should that be in form of a motion? to strike that portion of the ordinance under consideration? Yes. Mr. Mayor, I move that we strike Chapter 6, Section 6, okay, Chapter 6, Section 6-4A, which in particular refers to the keeping of dogs and cats, the number of dogs and cats permitted per dwelling. A I second that motion. Mm -hmm. Counselor. There's no made a motion. I just made a motion. No, you made a motion to change, but there's no motion to adopt the main ordinance. So the motion should be to move to adopt this NOI. Well, she's, she's, the, the ordinance would be with the change. 
she's amending the NOI, mm -hmm. which has already been considered. So that you're, amend, you're amending the, the, or, the ordinance that's going to be adopted? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So. There's a motion and a second to delete Chapter 6, Section 64A, specifically the keeping of dogs and cats. We're just voting on this deletion of the, the NOI. Is there any discussion? Discussion? Mayor, I apologize that I did not get the motion and who seconded. Motion and second. <laughs> There's no discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Anything else on your motion? No, thank you, Mayor. Just for the record, if there is an avenue in place currently to allow more than than the two that are currently in the law by getting a kennel license. So. You, you can still exceed the two so long as you, you go under the kennel license process. At this point, we're back on the entire NOI minus that section. Is there any comments from the audience? Well, okay, let him talk, and then you're next. Come on up, Paul. Okay, I know I'm just trying to clarify here at the uh, section 64A. So um, that's getting scratched, which is no more than three. But what is so that's scratched. So now how many animals, dogs and cats can people have? The current law, which we are no longer considering changing at this point tonight, states two. And that's a combination of cat and dog? Two cats, two, two dogs. Two dogs, two cats, a cat, or a dog. Okay. All right. Can I ask one more question while I'm here? You have the floor, so. Oh, okay. Well, so, um, someone here, when we when we buy our permit to have our chickens, where will that money go to? What will it be for? Counselor? That's going to go towards um, in the animal control office for the work that they do. So that's that's the intent is that that will cover some of the cost of the permitting procedure. Uh-huh. And then what happens to the chickens that are more than four? Um, we By have, whom? That, in the that, city limits? That would oh, be between... Kill chickens in the city limits. Yeah, the Excuse me. Polly, come back to me. Yeah. That would be between you and the court of authority and how any violation of that would be addressed. Okay. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm curious because I'm sure there will be some violations. Well, and this is where we have the, the notice of correction, corrective action, is you'd be notified, you have more for which you would know, <laughs> and you would need to, you would need to rectify that decision. Uh-huh. Or you would, you would need to get rid of, you need to dispose of those more than four in order to avoid a citation. Uh huh. Okay. So unless you were willing to take the citation, you would just you would uh, find a home for the others. Okay. I just wanted to get it clear. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councilors. My name is Kirk Pierce. Uh, it's been to Councilor Moronis. I spoke to you very early on in this process when all this kind of broke up. Uh, we had a good conversation on the phone. I want to thank you uh, for doing your work to get this ordinance brought to us tonight. Um, I want to address uh, Councillor Benson first. Uh, you were speaking about the meeting of needs for the people in our city, and I believe that's what this ordinance is about. Uh, we have a lot of people who need food, and eggs are food. And to limit the no number of chickens at four, is not an amount of food that is going to make much of a difference for anyone. 
If you say maybe eight chickens, half those chickens lay every day. That's four chickens for two people every day. That would be something that would make a difference. This ordinance is a patch. It's a bone you are throwing to the dogs, and I don't think it goes far enough. Uh, I do appreciate the right to cure because that's something that we have not been given to date. Uh, we have been given uh, immediate tickets uh, to get rid of our chickens uh, that we are relying on to feed ourselves with no recourse but to clog up the courts as we have done. Um, so I appreciate the right to cure, at least in, in what you're thinking about with this. There's a couple of things, aside from the number, that I take a special uh, issue with that I want to bring up. And it's because I believe that this ordinance, a lot of it's just legal for no real reason. And uh, specifically, this part that says that the chickens need to be in the backyard. Uh, no outdoor chicken enclosures shall be located uh, the chicken uh, the outdoor chicken enclosure shall be located in the backyard of the lot, not in the side yard or in the front yard. In our yard, our backyard goes about 20 feet back. Our side yard goes about 200 feet over. So you want us to put our chickens in the backyard in a 20 feet space rather than in the sensible place, which is the main yard, which is our side yard. Why? I'm asking a question. Is what, what was the thinking in, in that no chicken should be in the side yard or in the front yard, only in the backyard? The major thought there was the backyards are usually abutted up against your neighbor's backyards and uh, where they're, they're less visible from the roads, they're less visible by uh, potential real estate buyers, real estate sellers. So, so there's a, there was a big concern that, that was brought to our attention about the visibility of, of chickens. And where many of these individuals, they were concerned about that visibility, but they weren't concerned about chickens per se. They, they didn't mind us allowing chickens, but they were, they, they were worried about property values, uh, whether they could sell their homes, uh, and such. They, they wanted to keep a, a certain appearance of the, the neighborhood. And though we, we do respect your, your desire and your wants to have chickens, we also are concerned about those individuals as well. And this was the, well, logical way of, of going. It may not be the only way to go, but it was the path, it was a simple path to appease those individuals. There may be some other, some other issues that you had in regards to that, but that was, that was the most common concern that we we had is I don't mind if my neighbors have chickens I just don't want to see them on the sides or the front. If I could, um, the we don't have a zone map, do we? I actually have on the map. Yeah. Okay. Just going to turn a map around so that okay. we can talk about that. Um, in District One, um, there's a predominant. Zone A, residential A. Uh -huh. I'm not sure what's going to work fast, to be honest with you, with the way the room is structured. I'm not sure where you're going with it. So. Well, but let me just say that there's predominantly Zone A, and those are the residents that I heard from. Um, in the area of the district that I live in, it's a 25, I think, I believe, setback from the road, and they did not want to see any um, chicken coops or chicken signs because that um, area has been that way since it was first developed way back in the 1930s. So people bought their properties with that that scene and you know that scenic vista in mind. So I think that that's the reason why um, we arrived at a way to at least enable some folks to have chickens which would be in the backyard. And we know that this does not uh, meet everyone's needs. It's trying to strike a balance between, you know, different needs and what's best for the residents. I mean, it, it simply is a very, like most ordinances, that's all we could do is strike a balance. I, I, I hear you. Yeah. So you're saying you got most of your calls from from which section of your district? Well, actually, I got a lot of calls from residential A residential? all over. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing in, in, in that uh, a number of residents told me is, you know, 
we used to live in the county and we used to have farms or we used to have chickens but we moved into town you know they may be older or they may have just decided that it wasn't feasible to do the work anymore for any number of reasons they moved into town because because they wanted to have access to the goods and services that the town provides without having to, to worry about farm animals. And you, you, you have to understand, there are people that make that decision. No, no, you know what? Actually, actually, yeah. actually, okay. actually, excuse me. I'm just excuse sorry, me. but, you know, be nice, people. Let her talk. I'm, you know, their reasoning is just as important as everyone else's. And we have to take into consider everyone's concerns, not a select few on either side. So we try to strike a balance. Uh, and right now, maybe it's not the best one, but if this ordinance passes tonight and we begin to see how it works, it may change. Right now, the only option is to go back to the old ordinance. Okay. May I speak now? You know, when I'm finished, you certainly can. Remember, I'm the counselor, so okay. let me finish. So I think that it's important to understand, and that's why I think that one of the things that, that um, Councilor Ray had said early in the, in, the, in the meeting, you know, under council comments, you know, let's be respectful of other people's point of views. And we are doing the best that we can to meet those, those, those different needs. And like I said, it may not be the best, but this is the solution that we're offering at the present time. It's not set in stone. All ordinances change. So, I'm finished. I don't believe I've said anything that's disrespectful of anyone's point of view no, here I, yet. No, I agree. Okay. If we're going to be talking about respect and talking about people's needs, I don't know if you watch the news every day like I do. We're in the middle of a storm, okay? People need to feed themselves. This is basic human right for people to be able to provide for themselves and their families. And you people, I'm sorry, folks, this is important. This is not about chickens. This is not about the color of my house. This is not about aesthetics. This is about survival. Do you get it? Do you understand? Thank you. Next. Anybody else in the audience want to speak? Hi. Um, so, I would like to thank you all again. Things that I like about this ordinance, that they allow chickens, and that we will have a warning. I appreciate that. I think that there is a lot of things that are unnecessary and uncalled for. What I hear a lot from you guys, actually the only thing that I've heard against it is it's, it looks bad, it's the aesthetics. It's, it's the aesthetics is really the only issue that seems to be the problem. I got pictures from someone in town who took pictures of a neighbor's chickens who didn't like the way they looked. And even in his note it said, you know what, this is annoying, but I don't even care if it's 20 or 30 feet away from me. I'm cool with it. But you guys have gone that much further, and not just, you know, not just 20 or 30 feet. They also have to be enclosed so no one has to look at them. They also, you can't see them certain things. That's a lot of restrictions that even somebody who thought enough to take pictures and complain about, they didn't even need all those restrictions on it. And, you know, my main concern is that I feel like I have sent you lots of information about public health issues, why it makes sense that they could be they could be useful in a public health standpoint, why they could be um, I mean I pay about fifty for a dozen eggs. I don't even know how much you get, you know, the cheapest eggs you can get, but I don't think it's much less than that. But these are organic free range eggs that I'm getting for a buck fifty. So it's cheap food for people. Four, four chickens is not enough for a family. It's just not. And so, and in that vein, it helps with poverty and food and feeding people, and then also sustainability. I mean, there's all these reasons why it seems like a good thing. And I feel like we have tried to give you that information. We've tried to send you stuff. I've tried to send emails. 
things like that to let you know that. And your rebuttal back is that people think it looks bad. It looks bad. I would just say, you know, Amber, I have not brought this up at this point yet, but I will in response to your your expressed concerns. I did receive all your emails and folks, you know, that from you know a lot of folks. And in the past several weeks I've done a lot more research than I originally have done. And I have looked at all of the things that that folks have said, like, you know, the eggs are healthier for you, that, you know, backyard chicken eggs are healthier for you. That's actually, there is nowhere, anywhere, that I could find a scientific study that showed that. What I did find is a study by the FDA that showed that since 2002, because of the new feeds that are coming out and the new things you could do to enhance omega-3 egg production, that there's lower cholesterol in eggs today, in all eggs today, than there were in 2002, mainly because the, the food, you know, what you feed the chickens has changed. And so it, while many people believe they taste better, and, and I may agree with that, but I, I don't eat whole eggs um, because I can't. But it's, it's, it's not something that is a fact as has been um, provided to me and to, I think, others. The other thing I did is I did a lot of research on food security and um, an uh, animal husbandry professor at Texas A&M had written a paper specifically stating that uh, what they called mini flocks um, that exist in many larger municipalities as well as smaller ones are not economically feasible and cannot be used as a way to ensure food security, that you actually need to have a much larger number of chickens, which I know you're all asking for. But when you get to a larger number of chickens, some of the other concerns that were raised was the noise and the smell, again, the proximity to their homes. And, you know, we're, I'm personally trying to be as fair as possible here. I, I mean, I really am not sure... Um, what else I can do to um, let you know that we've tried to consider everyone. And as I said before, their opinion is just as important in terms of what they are concerned about as is yours. And they have rights as well with their properties. So I think we have, we've, I think we struck a balance and, and that's, that's can, I, can I respond to that before you? <coughs> Absolutely, I understand that. Um, you do have to take it and everything to everybody into account. I understand that, but does it not make a difference on the content of what they're saying? You know, if somebody says, I don't want chickens because I don't like the way they look, does it make more sense to listen to the person who says, I do want chickens because then I don't have to buy eggs and it's much cheaper for me? It seems like that would make more sense in general. And the reason that, you know, I understand that you say that you guys have been working on it, and I and I believe you, but I haven't seen any of the research that you guys have done. I've sent you research, but I haven't received any information back, which is why I'm asking for this now, because, you know, 15 days ago or however long ago, we had this meeting, and it was brought up, and you guys said, but we can change it. We can work on it. This is the beginning. Nothing has been done. Nothing has been changed. And so I want to know why. I want to know why, what your reasons are for you know, the exact same restrictions that were here a month ago or whenever we were here at our last meeting. Let me add to that real quick. It can't be amended between meetings. That's mm -hmm. what we're doing tonight. It can be amended tonight. And if we get too carried away and make enough amendments that we totally change the intent of the ordinance, then we're going to have another problem, another delay. Councilman Rogers? Um, basically, I was just going to mention that we, we haven't finished the amendments. The, before this being our, the final reading, this is where we'll be making most of our amendments if, if there's going to be some. What I've heard, though, is that you guys feel like you have made, it, and one of the email that I've received from Cynthia says that you feel like you have made a balanced decision. So that makes me think that you guys aren't interested in amending it. So I'm sorry. But, for, um, well, that's well, the well, reason. Councilor Bettison speaks for Councilor Bettison. Yeah. Yeah. She does not speak for the body. Right. So... She may feel that way, 
the body may totally disagree. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's that's why we do it here, and we cannot have a debate on behalf of the council via email. One, it's illegal. Two, is it's just not productive when we need to do it in front of you. And, and just a, a little further discussion on um, some of this as, as I was reading. You know, being from the area for, for a few generations, I have a lot of family in the incorporated town and towns, adjacent towns, and a lot of family in the um, unincorporated area. It's very much, those who live in the incorporated area don't, don't have chickens. It, I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. Those who live in the unincorporated area, in fact, most of them do have chickens. Our, my family re- has a lot of chickens, and one of the things is, as I was come, as I was looking at many of these items, the, these this, uh, these prescribed um, uh, standards that, that that we put here, that were based on other municipalities and what they came to and, and that we liked. As I looked at those. And looked at my family and, and talked to my family. How, how do you guys do? It? L- let me let me look at you. How how do you fit into this? And I noticed that most of those individuals in the county actually comply with a lot of this already. One of the things they don't comply with is they do feed them scraps. That that's one of their non-compliances. But and then one of their one of the things that doesn't it's hard to apply to them is the setback rules. But one thing when I was looking at the setback rules and I'm looking at, at some of my family members who have chickens, I noticed they did not have the chicken coops 20 feet from their house. In fact, they weren't even closer than 20 yards from their house. They were, they were generally very far from their house. And, and, I would, and I asked them, why do you have it so far? And they I don't want it that close to my house. And that made me think, well, why would I expect my neighbor to want it any closer? So, I, so even though... 20 feet is, is very restrictive, and, and it may be very prohibitive to, to many individuals. I, I just can't see, when, when, I, when I look at so many people in the unincorporated area, that they, they will not even bring those that close to their house. Why would we expect our neighbors to? So when, when, when these uh, individuals are saying, when I've had those, those criticisms, I don't want chickens next to me. I don't want them that close to my house. I, I look at that and I and I think strongly about that because I think those of my family who do have chickens don't want them that close either. <laughs> so that is something that's weighed in into my mind. And but generally, you know, getting back to that core point, most people that I have found with chickens comply with a lot of this. That there's just a few issues that we are a little more restricted uh, re- restrictive than. What, what most chicken owners have. Uh, scraps is something that we may, uh, we may look at debating. I, I know uh, John Crow had some very interesting language that, that, we, that could very possibly be uh, addressed as an amendment. Um, the number of chickens, it's, it's very possible that, that we could debate that up depending on where, where the council lies. We have to be careful with that debate because there is there's a point where that number grows to a, a level where you could lose support by some council council members and 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 we don't know if it dies and if this amendment dies as is or as amended then we're back to we are back to square one we we are we're basically going to be looking at another ordinance maybe. Um, I just wanted to, to, to give you to give you that um, as some perspective of, of where I've where I've gone and, and where I've accepted some, many of the things in here. But I am not I am not beyond uh, still supporting this ordinance, even with some amendments, uh, even some of those that I just articulated to you. I understand. Hopefully that helps. Sorry. I understand that completely. Um, but one thing when you tell me that your family says they don't want them near their home and so why would you expect other people well why why not I mean I I would like to have some kind of research on why it's a bad idea to have chickens that close to your home because you guys have asked for research from us on why it makes sense you know why it makes sense on a food security standpoint and all those other issues which of course you have 
And, of course, it's easy for us to spout that out because it makes sense to us, you know. But, of course, you know, it always needs to be based on some kind of research. So I understand where you're coming from with that. But at the same time, why? Because, you know, a lot of times poor chickens don't have to be that loud. They don't have to be that smelly and all those things. Um, so I, would, I think that with the things that are on there now, um, you know, the restrictions that say they need to be a certain amount of feet away from the neighbors and also need to be enclosed, it seems like maybe one or the other. Why both? There doesn't really seem like a need for both of those restrictions. And the kitchen scraps is definitely a, a big one for me because I feel like it's just, it's such an issue that we're dealing with, um, you guys, with the landfill and everything, and there's such an easy way to deal with that. And so that's that's another issue that I have. Um, and there was another one. Oh, ducks. I don't know if you guys thought about ducks or done any research about adding just that for ducks or chickens, just adding that in there. But um, ducks really aren't any different or more of a pest problem or, you know, any of those things. So I don't know if that's something that you guys have thought about, thought about or not. Thank you, Mayor. I'm trying to remember all the things I, I didn't write them all down <laughs> that I was going to say. I do want to say before I, 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 I address that is that, you know, as the Mayor stated, I represent myself. I mean, I believe that we, 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 we struck a balance. And that doesn't mean that I'm, as you already saw, that I'm not amenable to, to changing um, some parts, to amending some parts. Just realize that when you're talking to the council, you've got three other people here. And these two other councilors can make motions. They can make amendments. It's not just Councilor Moranis and myself that have to do that. So I just, I just want to make sure you understand um, that we're the sponsors. The, these, all these other council members have the ability to do action. Um, and I wanted to address the, the uh, I don't like the way they look, sort of consolidation of some of the issues that have been brought forward. You know, um, there may not be hard data, but we also have to include subjective data. And as the counselor most mentioned, you know, we have subjective and objective standards. And in this case, to me, that's a subjective um, uh, request because I couldn't find any data except for to find that you know in most towns that I looked at and that I examined there is a minimum number of chickens you know four to six that there's at least a 20 foot setback there's actually more in other towns even in the few towns that allow them in New Mexico and one in particular it's a 200 foot setback within the sea limits and that would pretty much make all of us you know any of us not able to have chickens um, and no we did not consider ducks because chickens were the issue that were brought before us but that does not mean that if this does or doesn't pass that amendments can't be made in the future and I just want to reiterate ordinances aren't set in stone in terms of that they're static where you can't change them you know, um, in the future, there can be amendments by future councils to change this, even to the point of reversing it completely back to the original, you know, no chicken. So I think people need to be aware that it's not static. It's a dynamic thing. And then um, we address concerns and ordinances. That's how we make these amendments. So um, I, I guess... Uh, I'm going to go back to saying, you know, I, I, the, I have some flexibility um, on the, you know, if you've got it screened, we could do the feeding of scraps. And I did like what um, John Crow brought forward with that. I think it's supposed to be in a contained environment. Uh, I'm trying to remember because I didn't bring it with me. It was very, you know, and I thought, well, that will work. Um, because they actually don't eat all chicken strips. Eat all chicken scraps is my understanding from the research I did. So that would that would enable um, that. And there's a little bit of leeway in the number of chickens, but there is a point where I will find it to be the number to be too excessive for 
the fact that, you know, we live in a town and we have some areas that are very dense in population. Um, I, I kind of take issue with your use of subjective and objective because just a, a, a little bit ago you stated that, you know, you were giving me reasons why what I had said, mm -hmm. you couldn't find any hard evidence on it. Just now you were saying that even though there's no hard evidence, that doesn't matter, you're taking it into account. So We, we really need to debate mm -hmm. the, yeah. the ordinance, not how we come to our opinions. I mean, let's stick to the topic and not... Not the counselor. Okay. Well, I mean, it, you know, if this is a food security issue, then increasing the number of chickens and things like that would make more sense, and having them allowed with a few less restrictions would make sense. So it seems like if that would make a difference, how they were how they were doing that. But and then the backyard thing. Um, I, I, you know, there are some instances where the backyard's not necessarily the backyard. So it might even run into more problems if you have to say the backyard because they might be a little bit closer to neighbors than if it was the side yard or the front yard. So that's something else that talk about. Thank you. Alan Lightman, I'm a resident of Silver City. Um, I don't have chickens. None of my neighbors have chickens. I'm mostly concerned about this ordinance as it stands now is a serious step towards a nanny state in Silver City. Um, if a nanny state is a government that sees that it has to step into the decision-making process that individual citizens ought to be making and do things for citizens that they ought to be doing for residents, that they ought to be doing for themselves. Um, Councilor Moronis, and I, I think you told me this privately, um, but you said it again tonight. Um, you talked about the fact that, that the, the issue about chickens is it's a complaint-driven process, and it, it usually involves neighbors complaining about neighbors, and people don't like to do that. But when an adult has a problem, that's what an adult does an adult act and it's an adult it's the responsibility of the person with the problem to do something about the problem not for the government to step in and legislate so that a citizen doesn't have to do it and it's also not even necessary because most of the problems that I've heard at the last meeting associated with having chickens, and I have no idea how, re how real what was said or not, because as I said, um, I don't have them, my neighbors don't have them, and 40 years ago, for about a year, I lived on a, in a farmhouse and we had chickens, and I didn't have the problems that I'm hearing about, but that's neither here nor there. The real thing is, is that, you know, the problems can be smell, it can be feathers flying out, it can be noise, can be sight. Well, all of those things are things that can be verified by a police officer who we have, the citizen has to call. I mean, even, even under the ordinance, um, it's still going to be complaint driven and it's still going to be somebody has to call the police, especially if you restrict the, if there is, things not put them in the backyard. Nobody's going to know there's an issue unless, unless somebody calls. And to the extent that people don't want to go to court, well, if the chickens smell, if the, um, if fruit scraps attract flies or, or smell, if there's feathers blowing around, a police officer called to the scene can see it as well as the person who is complaining and the police officer can be the one to go to court so it doesn't resolve that 
The other thing that makes it that, that makes it overly intrusive, in my view, is that instead of you do, I think I think in the ordinance you do you do refer to what some of the things that that, that constitute nuisance, but it's pretty clear what's a nuisance. If all you said was anybody who has chickens shall keep them in a manner that is humane, that does not create smells, that does not draw flies, that does not lead to feathers flying around, that does not need, lead to chicken food flying around, or whatever other negative impact it might have on their neighbors, then that person may have chickens. You're not prescribing what they have to do to prevent the odors, to prevent the chickens from being seen. If, if, I, if somebody can put chickens at the side of the house and put up a fence so the neighbor doesn't see it and the people in the front don't see it, that answers the realtor's objection. Let people come up with their own ways to resolve the issues that you're concerned about rather than prescribing what they can and can't do because it may well be that what you prescribe leads to some other problem. It always does. You're all, you always trade one set of problems for another. There's always something you didn't see, you didn't foresee when you try to prescribe how the problem is solved. So have the ordinance just say you can keep chickens unless you create problems. As for needing an objective standard, well, we can't always prove it's a nuisance, but we can have an objective standard. If there's more than four, we can prosecute for that. That might be characterized as the, as, as the Al Capone theory. They couldn't get Al Capone for murder or extortion or racketeering or bribery, so they got him for income tax um, evasion. But the difference is income tax evasion was actually something that was wrong. They didn't get him for what they wanted, but he was doing something else wrong, and they got him for it. But if somebody has five chickens, why prosecute? And you can't prove that the five chickens were a nuisance. Now you want to prosecute them for, for having the five chickens, even though you don't, you can't prove anything was wrong with having five chickens. It's easy to see the abuse in that. I don't like my neighbor. He pisses me off. His chickens don't bother me, but he's got five of them. I'll call the cops, and they'll get him for having five chickens. And you end up not prosecuting a crime. You end up prosecuting a person. It just opens the door for that. If you can't prove somebody's doing something wrong, don't prosecute. Don't, don't, don't set up a law so that, okay, we'll still be able to prosecute for something that all by itself isn't wrong, but we've set it up so we can still get it for that. Is this, is this NOI, what it proposes, better than current law? Yes. Is it better enough? No. Will passing it delay a, re, a, a submission of a different NOI? that might do it better, probably. And to the extent that passing something now when, you, when it could be written better, when it could address the problem rather than prescribing solutions, when it could address the problem without making criminal something that shouldn't be, Unless you can amend it tonight, which it probably takes more work to do what I'm suggesting than, than can be done with amendments tonight. I favor that you vote this one down and write one that allows people to come up with their own solutions for avoiding whatever problems chickens might cause. And that doesn't put arbitrary reasons for citations when there may not actually be a real offense. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience like to speak? Council? Yeah. You have the floor? We've heard a lot. Go ahead, go ahead. 
Hi, my name is uh, Mark Woodson, and um, I appreciate y'all taking the time to listen to me. Um, when I read this ordinance, you know, the way it makes me feel is it's like we'll give them their chickens, but as long as they, uh, as long as they treat it as a novelty item, these chickens aren't like a novelty item to most of us or any of us, honestly. Uh, and I, I would say, for me, the ch my chickens are a food source, a garbage disposal, and pets. And for me, it's in that order. And, um, you know, for other people, maybe it comes to pets first. This, I don't even care about that. But, you know, um, it just seems kind of, kind of like, just we got thrown a real small bone. I sure hope the bone gets a lot bigger. And we need to. To, to realize that we're not we're not playing around here. We're we're trying to to eat and we're trying to get rid of our waste in a in a non hell a lot a lot less smelly of a way than putting it in my trash can until I get around to throwing it away because the trash only comes once a week and um, my chickens will get rid of that stuff that would create a smell real quick. It'd just be over with. And for those of us who have chickens, we know what the chickens are going to eat up and what they're not going to eat up real quick. I had a crock pot that got real low on beans. I have the crock pot full of beans because I'm kind of poor. I have chickens for the same reason. Sometimes I like to take the beans to put a fried egg on top of it. And so you see where my, the chicken appeal is just for me. Um, so anyway, they got real low. They kind of burnt a little bit. And I took them out to the chickens, and they were gone. My neighbors didn't even know those beans existed. Now, I didn't take a big old barrel of raw turnips out there for them and expect them to get tore up in a matter of minutes. But I throw a banana out there, that's all, that thing is gone quick. Um, so the table scrap, that's one thing that I am opposed to, the lack of using table scraps for your chickens. The... Um, not only do I eat eggs, I eat chickens, so <laughs> I don't know how I'm about to, I'm not going to go outside, I'm not going to go out to Membrae so I can, so I can butcher my chicken. Well, I don't think it's reasonable to expect me to, as long as I, you know, deal with the chickens in a non feather throwing it over my neighbor's fence sort of way. Um, so, I mean, like I said, this, this ordinance, and, and I hope I'm wording this in a way that doesn't point the finger at anybody specifically, but this ordinance makes me feel like you can have your chickens, bro, as long as you just call it a novelty item. You know, you're not going to get a whole, a whole grip of food out of it, but you can say, yeah, yeah, I got chickens. I want to be able to say, uh, here, neighbor, have a bunch of eggs. How's that? I got, I got um, enough for me, and I just happened to, you know, feed them a bunch of really good food they got laid a decent chunk of eggs they got oyster shell they got grit I give them I mean we take care of our chickens because we we care like people that aren't going to take care of their chickens probably aren't going to have chickens they're probably not going to like it's probably not going to be a priority in their life is having chickens so um and there's going to be a few that do but uh they probably will get bored with the whole thing and you try to give them to me, you know. So, um, and that brings up another thing. It's real hard to get rid of, rid of a chicken if you got extra, you got four chickens, you got five chickens. You got to get down to four. Boy, that I gotta chase my tail all day just to find a home for for. I may not get it done. So, um, uh, without getting too much more scattered about which direction or which issue to take, you know. You guys can. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. I do want counsel right now. You want to let them talk to the come up with any amendments before you talk or I would like to say I would just like to move the point the other one. I just want to make a comment on uh, on the chicken issue. Councilor Bedison and Councilor Morones have tried to do their best in finding the needs for the people. I'm going to give you my opinion. And this is just my opinion as a counselor and as a person. 
To me, it doesn't matter who has chickens. I don't care. If you're a responsible person, then you're a responsible person. If you have 10 chickens, that's fine. If you got 20 chickens, that's fine. But be responsible. Be a very responsible person and nothing bad can ever come out of it if you are, if you, if you do it. We've had some good comments and we had some bad comments. And I respect Councilor Bereson and Councilor Maloney for trying to do this thing here. And it's a hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do because you're trying to please everybody. And it's impossible to please everybody. Thank you. Um, my name is Alexi, and uh, I thank you all for um, considering this issue and continuing to hear input. Um, I just wanted to say, um, for the record, I don't have chickens, but um, I very much support what Mr. Wagman was suggesting. Um, create an ordinance that uh, permits the keeping of chickens if they're kept in such a way that doesn't create smells and create um, other nuisances. But leave it up to people to come up with how they're going to prevent the nuisance. And I understand the comment that um, people don't want to complain about their neighbors. Like, I didn't really want to complain about my neighbor's dogs getting loose and terrorizing my cats because I wanted to keep good relations. And um, ultimately, the neighbors, you know, fixed their dog enclosure. So that wasn't too much of an issue. But, you know, at the same time, um, if for example, Kurt is keeping his chickens in his side yard, and I know they've talked to their neighbors. Their neighbors don't have a problem with how they're keeping their chickens. It just it doesn't strike me as a good practice for um, them to still be, be um, fined or cited for being in violation if there's no complaint. Um, and as far as the economics and health concerns, you know, last time... I spoke um, to some of those concerns, and I feel that may have been the wrong tack because really all of us have our own personal values. And for some of us, you know, we don't want those cheaper eggs that you can get at certain stores that came from the factory farms. And so there, there's just a whole slew of issues to consider. It might not be the cheapest source of food, but for our various reasons, you know, it... Um, really is something we value much more apart from just the the price of uh, raising and keeping chickens. So um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, as far as the kitchen scraps, if you're deciding to basically stick with the um, proposed changes, um, I would suggest changing that part to prohibiting um, having rotting kitchen scraps because my understanding is that that's the main issue. Um, if the kitchen scraps are gone, um, are eaten by the chickens, then it doesn't sound like anyone has a problem with that. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you. to speak about the dog and cat issue. If a people have had for a long time uh, more than two dogs or two cats and they are very responsible in taking care of them in good care and their animals do not bother the neighbors or anyone and they are very attached to their animals, what, uh, why should they get rid of an extra animal that they have when they've had them for many years and they're a part of the family? Uh, their family members, they're loved like children, and they're very well taken care of, and they don't bother anyone, and they're enclosed in a fence. Then, therefore, uh, why put a limit on just two animals, one cat or one dog, when they've had, they've been a part of this family for many years, and why, why are they going to be taken out of the family and gotten rid of when they are family members and very loved? 
And it's not easy to get rid of them once they are, they, uh, your uh, family is attached to them and uh, they're not bothering anyone. Why uh, get into people's business and limit them just to two, one cat or one dog, if they've, they've been that, uh, not ten or a bunch of them, but why do they have to be just two if there's three or some people have three, some have four? I didn't say more than that, but they are a part of a, of a family structure. And uh, they're well taken care of, as I said, and they don't bother anyone, and they're in an enclosed fence, and the yards are kept clean, there's uh, no filth in there. Then what is going to happen? Why, why not leave? In the last meeting, they said three dogs or three cats were going to be the limit, perhaps, and now she changed it to two. I, that's not right. Can I respond? You done? Pardon? Are you finished? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, as the mayor mentioned before, and what helped uh, motivate us for that initial amendment before is the current or ordinance is does limit to two, but does have opportunities for those who have more to to simply go get a a kennel license. So the the current ordinance as it stands actually does have a remedy for those who have three and have been caring for their animals and are not creating a nuisance to their to their neighbors it's just simply a one extra step the current ordinance does expect you to go get a a kennel permit and 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 then you can have uh, the greater could you number explain further about this kennel permit i, I don't even know where the with the licensing i i would have to ask for staffs of help on that one um, it, where do they apply really, for that? It's really not a part of the business that we're on right now. We mm -hmm. that is available to you. That exactly how to go about a kennel permit. It's in the current code. Well, I'm not speaking for myself, but I'm <laughs> speaking for people that I know in the community uh -huh. that it will affect. And uh, they are elderly. And they love their animals, uh, and their children are attached to them. Uh, they're part of the family. They're like considered like children. Some elderly don't have any children or grandchildren. These are their family. And it will affect them emotionally and get them sick. Uh, it, it, it cause heartbreak and everything. So why be so strict on just limiting to two animals? Well, a cat or a dog, if, if they already have had them for many years. What do they yeah, expect these people to do? Apply for a kennel? A kennel uh... Ma'am, it's, it's not on the table right now. That that topic is not even on the table right now. The there's the only thing in here about dogs and cats is the permitting fees. The there is existing law. They don't have to dispose of their excess. They have to follow the existing law that makes them legal to have more. It's we're we're not considering even the topic. This, we're not even considering this topic right now that you're talking about. Well, it was brought up earlier it's by but, her. But it was addressed. It was it was dealt with and ended by a motion and a vote. We, it's coming back. I can guarantee you because right now there's a comprehensive animal ordinance that's in this um, clerk's office that's being formatted, reformatted, and put into into ordinance form that will address the whole animal issue pretty much from top to bottom, I would say. Yes, because people cannot move out of the city limits with their animals, and they're not not—they're part of the family. They're not going to get rid of them. They love them. They adore them. They're like their, their children. Well, they, are, they don't have children. They're like their children. But do they expect them to move out of the city limits, and they can't. They're only homes that they have to live in. They should consider the feelings of the people in the community. Maybe there are people that don't, they don't love animals. They don't like animals. They don't have pets. They don't know what it is to love animals, pets, and be attached to them. And they're, they're their children because they don't have any children. Maybe they don't, they're not pet lovers, so they don't care about the feelings of people with Thank animals you. and want to limit them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I move for a short break. Mr. Mayor, I second it. There's a motion and a second to take a short break. 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We're in recess. Call this meeting back to order, and we are on Ordinance 1188. And is there anybody else in the audience that wanted to speak? John Crow. So. <clears throat> I understand when you all started out, we talked about your intent, and your intent was to provide some kind of guidance uh, for health reasons, cleanliness, which is commendable, I go for that. And so we talked about size of a chicken coop and a chicken run, so we weren't going to replicate corporate chickens. And so you did incorporate that. But I felt like you missed the point. And the point was that that was the means to control how many chickens were on any given piece of land. For example, a person who owns a 25 by 50 lot could only get maybe one coop. But I have a lot that's 100 feet wide by 150 feet deep. Now that's a third of an acre, just over. So I'm going to be discriminated against because I can only have four chickens. But I could fit a few of those coops on my piece, but I'm not allowed to. And I have six people in my house. And so like somebody pointed out, it's kind of a novelty, right? And so I thought I didn't miss the point. I think you need to go back and revisit that. And if you want to limit chickens to the number, limit it by size of coop that you could get on your piece of land, okay? You, you have a minimum size coop. And so if you have a small piece of land, you might be able to only get one of this minimum and have only four chickens. But I can have a lot more than that, but I'm going to be prevented because of your insistence on a control of four. Okay? And so you've nearly, you've nearly made it impossible for an average size lot in this town to have any chickens at all. You've just about totally blocked it because an average size lot is about 50 by 50. That's about average. Although you go around town, it gets really strange here and there. There's different sizes because there wasn't any kind of standard way back when a lot of the surveys were done. But you've just about prevented an average household from having chickens. And I'm not sure that was your really in intent to do that. Maybe, but give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, the other issue is <clears throat> maybe we can have a show of hands for uh, see where these people are that <clears throat> oppose it. Did any of them come? No. Nobody is here to oppose having chickens. Now, I know that you have a leadership role and all that sort of stuff, but uh, it's always a nice thing to ask when there's a bunch of people from one side, nobody from the other side, but the other side is having an awful lot of say when they're not here. So, anyway, so that's an out. That could be a situation where you limit the number of chickens by a minimum size coop that you could get on your land, you could have three or four if you had a third of an acre. Or you could have one if you didn't have such a draconian setback. Now, a house is supposed to be set back five feet from the property line, right? A side of a house is supposed to be set five feet back by code. So, 
when you say you have to have chickens 20 feet away from the property line, that's 25 feet away from the house. So this is nearly draconian. When you have a, if you have a 50 foot lot or even a 25 foot lot, no chickens for you. So let's say, this is to be honest about it, let's say, the only people who can have chickens in this town is if you have a 100 foot wide lot by 100. And if you don't, you can't have chickens. And I'm not sure that that's fair either, but this is an out for you to be able to provide some kind of standard by which we're not going to have chickens shoulder to shoulder so you could define a minimum coop and run. Thanks, Doug. Anybody else? Okay. I'm going to bring it back to the council. Anybody? Council Rose. Mr. Bittner, I'd like to just discuss a, a couple items that uh, presented here and, and have been presented uh, over the, the duration of this NOI that, that I'd be real, um, I, I would like to see changed so that when a motion is made, I wouldn't mind seeing these amendments. I would, not, I, I would like to see the, uh, the number go from four to six. I would also, and, and that is on uh, section 6-64A, where it says uh, a household be uh, permitted to keep up to, it currently strike out four and six female chickens within the corporate limits of town. I would also like to see uh, in a motion um, a change on the same section, J, with due regard for neighboring properties, chickens shall be fed dry feed, clean water, and kitchen scraps in a feed container free of garbage and rotten scraps. And in the same section, L, I would like to just have L struck. which is uh, chickens shall not be killed within the corporate limits. I think there's plenty of ways for chickens to be killed without anybody really knowing about it. Those are just some of the, some of the items. On the, you know, I, I'm, I'm, there, there's some areas I would like to see changed. I just, don't know how I would change them in an amendment at this point, and hopefully they, they could be, if there are issues even in here, that they would be remedied in a, in, a, uh, in a comprehensive ordinance. But for those who want to, uh, so, so that we can bring some of our, our citizens who are, you know, in all other aspects of being good law-abiding citizens, I would, I would love to just have them be able to have this ordinance passed and so that they can move forward and, and even if some of this is restrictive hopefully we can get a test for how this works and maybe this will help uh, uh, Councilor Thompson in, in the comprehensive ordinance let's see how this works and if it doesn't uh, hopefully his uh, hopefully his will will fix that I, and I'd just like to ask uh, Councilor Bettison's um, uh, input on those suggestions. I, I'd like to say that I agree with the suggested um, amendments that um, we're discussing at the present time without a motion. Um, and I'm torn. I'm torn between... Um, Scrapping this and going and waiting for Councillor Thompson's 
versus um, moving forward with this with um, some suggested amendments so that some uh, of our citizens can move forward and be able to have chickens and to be able to use it as a test. Uh, right now at this time, I don't know how I'm going to vote on the NOI with with these potential um, um, or the ordinance with these potential amendments just because of the comments that have been said here. And I do know that a comprehensive ordinance is coming forward. So um, I just want you to know that um, all of you here, as well as other people that had commented to me prior to um, coming here tonight, that I'm, I'm taking it all in and that, it, you know, I would hope that if I decide to vote against any amended ordinance that you would understand it's because um, I am hopeful that um, another ordinance may be brought forward that would best uh, meet the needs that have been expressed here tonight as well as the needs of the other citizens. Just, just for the comments, well, one of my motivators to to getting this done and, and uh, you know, trying to fix some of the imperfections of the current ordinance, and even though this amendment may have some imperfections as well, I, I really, I, 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 I understand that Councilor Thompson's going to, you know, he's going to have a, a, a big task ahead of him. And I know that there's been a couple uh, comprehensive ordinances brought forward to prior councilors um, that have failed. And, and, and hopefully that's not the case with Councilor Thompson's. But I want to get this out there and, uh, and have some uh, consideration for those of you who want chickens and, and get this in place so that we have some immediate remedy in case the debate um, goes awry with a, with a comprehensive plan, and and we'll we'll see where that goes. But I, I just know that current history has shown that that comprehensive plans have been very difficult to be passed, which is why our current ordinance, ordinance is very old. We have a very old ordinance because act in that manner to be able to give someone. Um, a warning with that remedy without having to go to court without if we don't pass this that won't exist we go back to the current ordinance which does not provide for administrative enforcement and it goes straight to um, citation in court so <coughs> out of everything that's it's that that we have done in this ordinance with all of its faults, that is one very, very good thing in this proposed ordinance that doesn't have a fault associated with it in terms of ensuring an option where, you know, if you've gone through the permitting process, you've done everything, that you're going to be given fair warning if someone calls and complains about it. So you're going to be given the opportunity for corrective action without straight citation. So. You know, that is really holding me back from just, you know, going forward and, 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 and potentially just saying no to the whole thing in the hopes of redoing a new one or with Councilor Thompson's comprehensive. So I just want, you know, I will, whatever I finally decide when the vote comes forward, I will probably explain myself if given the opportunity. Thank you. I just want to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Councilor Morales is uh, proposing right now. Uh, Run back. <laughs> and Councilor Morales has proposed amendments. Um, he mentioned the, the, the number to be changed in, I think, subparagraph, I think he said subparagraph A. It also appears in subparagraph K. I just wanted to point that out. That four appears twice. If you're going to change it, you need to change it in two different places to six. Thank you. It, it does appear one more time. On K? Where are we at? It also appears in section 6-78A in the back. Chickens will be 1 to 6 instead of 1 to 4. Our last page. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
last page where it sets the permit fees, it would be one to six rather than one to four. It's always fun that I get to sit here and listen to everything before I get take the chance to talk. But, you know, I, I, I've done as much research as anybody has. I've looked at all sorts of websites. For every argument for, there's an argument against. For every data set that's against, there's data for. It's, it's pretty much a matter of what is the town going to tolerate. Well, I think in making that decision, the answer's pretty much already been decided what the town will tolerate because I think we have a significant number of chickens in the town that nobody was really aware of and is not aware of today probably. So the tolerance for it has pretty much already been determined. It's and it was out of our control. I I've had lots of opportunity to speak to people that are for or against. They all have good points. They're I, I don't have chickens. I I may in my future. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm not in full control of my home. Um, and I got grandkids that live there and may want chickens. So I, I'm really not against them. And as I spoke before, and this may sound a little contradictory, and it, but it's kind of the, the way the, the laws are constructed in the town and the, and the purpose and intent for them, as, as we spoke of earlier. We have to set a standard. If you look at the entire land use code, we are setting neighborhood standards and it gets spoke about in almost every hearing that you're we're establishing neighbors standards you're making sure that that activities in a neighborhood don't stand out very drastically so we we do have to set the standard and i don't buy the art the argument that it can be solely based on nuisance and, and my argument on that would be somebody doing 70 down 180 in Arenas Valley at 2 in the morning is probably not harming anybody. But if the cops find him, he's going to get a ticket. So we already have tons and tons of laws out there that are based on whether you get caught or not. So as we work on this and we try to, to figure out what is the best balance, we really have to figure out what is the tolerance level of the community and I think that has been determined. I think we have to figure out what do we do with with violators. I'm, I am a little concerned that we have an impound aspect of this ordinance and we have nowhere to impound them to. So don't bring them to my house. <laughs> And if we take them to your house, you'll probably exceed the six. So <laughs> you'll have a problem then. So I, I am a little concerned about that. I, I, I think it's worth a try. And I, I think they've, they've made a good effort. I could tell you, and Councilor Moronis referenced this, there's, there's very few topics in this town that will drive attendance at a council meeting and animals is way up on the list when you start talking about dogs and cats and people's pets and it gets attendance at council meetings and that's been historically why the comprehensive ones have failed is it gets aggressive attendance at council meetings and it's easier to just leave status quo and walk away from it. However, this is an interesting one that this issue is not driving council attendance. We have plenty of chairs here. So 
tells me people either don't care or they're satisfied with the the NOI. So with that, I will see if we have a, a motion. Mr. Mayor. Council. I move for approval of ordinance number 1188, an ordinance amending chapter 6, section 6-1, definitions. Section 6-4, keeping of dogs and cats. Six, section 6-6, six -six, keeping of cattle, horses, fowl, or livestock restricted. Section 6-55, citations contents. Section 6-56, failure to pay assessment or correct action. Section 6-78, annual license permit of the Town of Silver City Municipal Code with the following amendments. Chapter 6, Section 6-6, 4A, a household be permitted to keep up to six female chickens within the corporate limits of the town. Same section J, with due regard for neighboring properties, chickens shall be fed dry feed, clean water, and kitchen scraps in a feed container kept free of garbage and rotten scraps. Same section K, uh, last sentence, uh, number of chickens up to a total of four, or, sorry, a total of six female chickens. Same section L, taken out. And on the final page, section 6-78A, chickens, one to six chickens, $25. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, I second the motion as stated. Is a motion and a second? Council. Uh, for orderly sake, I made this point earlier on in the discussion. There is another change to this ordinance, and I, I thought that was kind of putting the cart before the horse. We were amending the NOI, but the six point, the six dash four A is deleted and replaced with six dash four, keeping of dogs and cats. I think it should be mentioned now while you're making these amendments to this ordinance that that should be included in the motion. You know, it's, too, it's repetitive, but it, it's better for reading this, this amendment. Mr. Mayor, I would also like to amend my motion to include striking out section 6-4, section, uh, keeping the dogs and cats. A, the number of dogs and cats permitted per dwelling unit shall be no more than three, three in any combination. That to be stricken out. I second the motion. The amended motion. There's a motion and a second to approve as amended. Any discussion? Any discussion? Is everybody confident that you know what the amendments are? Mayors, um, Council Moranis, would you repeat the amendment to J? I don't think I'm going to the entire okay. statement. It's all the same up until B. So with due regard for neighboring properties, chickens shall be fed dry feed, comma, clean water, comma, and kitchen scraps in a feed container kept free of garbage and rotten scraps. What? I think it's supposed to be or kitchen scraps rather than and. Or. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter? All right. We, we're done, sir. Come on. Really, I 
Thank you for striking the section L for the killing of chickens. Mm -hmm. On page uh, four of seven, section L, halfway through the page. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's also mentioned in the rural district. That's correct. Um, section L, sorry, page five at the bottom, line up. That's line. Yeah, that's that's line. Line. Not, not chickens. chickens. That's like slaughtering cows. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big thing. No, thank you. <laughs> Any other discussion? Everybody's confident that you're comfortable with the amendments. Understand them. There is a motion and a second to approve ordinance number 1188 and ordinance amending chapter 6 section 6 one definition section 6 four keeping of dogs and cats section 6 six keeping of cattle horses fowl or livestock restricted section 655 citations content section 656 failure to pay penalty or correct violation section 678 animal license permit of the town of silver city municipal code as amended tonight roll call please councilman Morales. aye Councilor Ray? Aye. Councilor Thompson? Aye. Councilor Madison? Aye. Motion carries. Thank The next item on the agenda is approval disapproval of ordinance number 1189 and ordinance amending appendix C land use and zoning code of 2010 article 6 administration section 6.1.1 planning and zoning commission of the town of Silver City Municipal Code. This once again is a final reading of this ordinance and this is to repair a clerical basically error that that section was left out of the last codification of our code and is being replaced. Originally it had a recommendation for a five member of the DMZ that is, was since removed and we're leaving it unchanged for the previous code. Discussion? Discussion? Any discussion in the audience? Yeah, nobody cares. <laughs> I think that one of the points that is significantly different from the previous code is that in this case, all appointees to planning and zoning must be residents of the town. Yes. And that was done based on the ETZ commission. They have represent, representation out there. Any other discussion? Mr. Mayor. I move that we approve ordinance number 1189, an ordinance amending appendix C, land use and zoning code of 2010, article 6, administration, section 6.1.1, planning and zoning commission of the town of Silver City Municipal Code. Mr. Mayor, I second it. There's a motion and a second to approve. Is there any discussion from the council? There's a motion, a second, no discussion to approve ordinance number 1189 and ordinance amending appendix C land use and zoning code of 2010 article 6 administration section 6.1.1 planning and zoning commission of the town of Silver City Municipal Code. Roll call please. Councilor Benson? Aye. Councilor Johnson? Aye. Councilor Ray? Aye. Councilor Ray? Aye. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is approval disapproval of notice of intent to adopt ordinance number 1190, an ordinance authorizing the sale of that town property described as lot 7, block 7, San Vicente subdivision, Silver City, Grant County, New Mexico. Mr. Coates. Nobody stuck around for your show. <laughs> Don't take it personal. <laughs> and Mr. Charles Demi of 121 Richard Street um, approached the town several months ago about the purchase of a lot next to his home. It's a 50 foot by 100 foot lot. And it is owned by the town. 
that has been owned by the town since 1984. Um, and he would like to purchase that lot because he wants to provide some use, some defensible space for his, his home. The lot is um, steep, very, um, and it's shrubland, basically. It's a vacant lot, but it happens to also be next to a neighborhood park. Um, the neighborhood park is, is three plus some lots, and then there's part of a fourth lot, and then the lot which is next to his house. The lot is green, or surrounded by green there. On the right of that green space is um, a little bit more vacant lot, and then three lots of a park, and then his home is right next to it on the left. The, and the, the area is up, um, El Refugio is just to the left. The senior center is down in the lower left-hand corner. Um, Hudson Street's over on the right, so just to orient yourself. And so the, the lots themselves, um, that are the lot in question is lot 7, block 7, which is next to the house on the left, and then there's four other town-owned lots, three of which make up the town or the, the neighborhood park there. Um, Mr. Deming would like to purchase it. We, the, the departments of the town that looked at the, the property have not seen any reason not to sell the property, that it's not going to obstruct any of the plans or um, any further development of the park. Um, the parks or the, the public works department says they don't have any further plans for the park. This is the park and up at the top, um, to the top of the, is Mr. Deming's home. You can see that the, the vacant land at the end of the park is rough and um, very steeply graded. This is the corner of the property um, of Mr. Deming's on the right, and then the vacant lot to the left is the property that he'd like to purchase for defensible space. Um, you can see that the, the land there is fairly steep. Um, that's his house up at the top, and it's actually built on a, um, a leveled space with a, a high retaining wall, and then there's another probably 15, 20 feet that he has an, another level space where his carport is at the... Um, that point there is the start of the lot in question, and this is about the point where the, the lot, the, the width of the lot. So it's it's a 50 foot lot. Um, it that's the grade looking down on the park, and what he would like to do with it is um, make it more defensible for his own home. Um, another shot of the grade. I, I wanted to provide you some some context of what the grade of the, the land looks like there and why it hasn't been developed either by the, the parks department or um, anybody in the, in the past before the town acquired it in 1984. Um, it took a while to come to you about this issue because of trying to figure out exactly how the, the, the town sells property to a neighbor, an adjoining neighbor. And working with Mr. Stavron, we came to the conclusion that you needed the notice of, of intent for an ordinance. And in another um, 15 days or more, you'll be presented with the ordinance to pass it again. And then if the uh, ordinance does pass. It will take Mr. Deming then 45 days wait for the sale to actually go through, and everything has to be noticed along the way. Um, any questions? The property is appraised at $8,800, which push, puts it over the $5,000 limit, where it could actually happen, but um, because it, 
and we have because it's under ten thousand, you can make a private sale of it. But it, it, over five thousand, we have to go through an ordinance process. And uh, is there a determination that the domestic violence shelter has no functional use for the property? That it wouldn't be offered to them? Um, they didn't ask for it. This the process started through the request by Mr. Benning to purchase it. And once you have agreed to sell, if that if that's what you decide to do, then others could come forward with other bids. But it can't be sold until you go through the ordinance process of allowing it to be sold. Is, am I correct with that, Mr. Shadow? Was, was notice ever given to any of the neighbors about the sale? No, it was besides through the notice of intent of the ordinance. And then there will be a notice provided for the when the um, ordinance actually comes up. A process that qualifies for private sale to a joining landowner uh, can be converted to a bidding process if other adjoining property owners wish to contend. But and that was my original concern when I saw this this map was the intent of doing a private sale was only do a private sale when one adjoining landowner has a reasonable use of the property. And that was so uh, we have a lot of twenty foot white strips around town that I don't go buy a 20 foot hair strip and put in a hot dog stand next to your house or some other nuisance. So I want to make sure that we're we're meeting that requirement and it's been five years since we've looked at that. We tried to address the issues of allowing it to be sold, but if the council so pleases through the the um, whereas is within the ordinance itself. Um, one of those being that it can be offered to private sale if it's usable to the adjoining land. Um, it gets into the potential of being um, sold to others after the ordinance goes into effect, which is why the 45-day period after the ordinance is going into effect. May I read the paragraph that applies? Town-owned property available for sale, lease, or exchange shall be sold by competitive bid unless the town council finds that competitive bidding is inappropriate due to the size, shape, or location of the parcel, rendering it, rendering it of true usefulness to only one party. Further, any sale as permitted in this subsection may be made by private sale when there is only one interested purchaser after implementation of the notice and publication requirements. If there are two or more prospective purchasers, the sale shall be by competitive bid, as described in the remainder of this subsection. So when you're doing this NOI, now there's an opportunity if the, any other adjoining landowner wants to come forward, and then you'd have to convert this from a private sale to competitive bid. Is that your understanding as well, Mr. Well, thank you. Just, just to try to clarify for myself, it's not necessarily like just opening it up to private sale. It's specifically to a Mr. Demon in the NOI. But this process, if someone, a neighbor or someone else came forward, then the, even though the NOI says Mr. Demon's name, it could be changed to... Well, this is part of the notice to the public, and if there's another adjoining landowner that has an interest, then it will be converted from private okay. sale to competitive bidding. Okay. Just, just trying to clarify for myself. Thank you. Any, 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 any,
anybody in the audience like to speak on this? No. Councilor Thompson. Um, to get back to your uh, comment about the hot dog cart, is there any possibility of uh, restricting use in the sale and what that property can be used for? Um, through the zoning code, it's, it's a residential A, I believe, and that would restrict what it could be done unless it goes through a conditional use or a variance. Can we go above that, though? Um, can they, can they can go above that in restricting the use? Well, if you do that, you're going to be affecting the appraised value when you put a restriction on land other than what's already there from the zoning, it, it changes the appraised value. So um, most of the time you don't like putting condition, unless you're going through a conditional use process, you don't like selling land that's encumbered that way. I know it, you're, you're wondering whether like a portion of it could be saying you can't build on it. Well, if you, there is a, a the setback rule on the back of the property would apply. Um, tacking on an easement, a drainage easement, or a town easement, or something would probably destroy the value of the property to the owner. We have to have another appraisal and do the process over again. Chicken people are going to wish they hadn't left for this question. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the backyard on this lot? Yeah. Uh, we have a definition of backyard in, in the ordinance. It says from the back drip edge of the structure of the primary residence, there is no primary residence or residence on the lot. I, this is kind of off the subject, but um, more than my my understanding of how that's defined within the land use code is, and the way parcels are set up. Once that lot is part of Mr. Deming's property, then that would his house would be quite at least fifty foot set back from the side, and then. The back setback would still be the same, which would be behind his primary residence. Not his his side lot would be um, excellent space for a chicken coop, but <laughs> it would be the side of the yard. That's a very good answer. Thank you. I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> Any other discussion? Discussion. Entertain a motion, Mr. Mayor. I move to approval on notice intent to adopt ordinance number 1190, an ordinance authorizing the sale of that town property described as lot seven, block seven, <coughs> San Vicente subdivision, Silver City, Grand County, New Mexico. Mr. Mayor, I second that motion as stated. There's a motion second to approve. Is there any discussion? There's a motion second to approve notice of intent to adopt ordinance number 1190 ordinance authorizing the sale of that town property described as lot 7, lot 7, San Vicente subdivision, Silver City, Grant County, New Mexico. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, sir. Next item on the agenda is approval, disapproval of destruction of records from the executive finance accounts payable, finance utility billing, municipal court, police recreation center, and public works departments. Quantity 152 boxes. Okay. Mr. Mayor, Council, I'm asking for your approval of destruction of the 152 boxes. They have met for retention. Um, limit according to state records and archives. They've been checked by myself and state records has given their approval for the destruction and I'm asking for your approval. Mr. Mayor, I move, sorry, I move that we approve destruction of records from the executive finance dash accounts payable, finance dash utility building, billing, Municipal Court, 
Police Recreation Center and Public Works Department, quantity 152 boxes. Mr. Mayor, I second that motion. Ms. Stager? There's a motion and a second to approve the request for destruction of records. Is there any discussion? There's a motion and a second, no discussion, to approve the destruction of records from the Executive Finance Council Payable Finance Utility Billing Municipal Court, Police Recreation Center, and Public Works Department, quantity 152 boxes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Can I play this game again? Can I take a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. I second the motion. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned.